Augustinian Calvinists claim the only person to correctly interpret the Apostle Paul's deterministic scriptures for the first four centuries was Augustine. But, of course, they omit the Stoics, Gnostics, and Manichaeans who previously interpreted these texts as teaching unilateral determinism. Now, um, one of the challenges here is that the vast majority of even our audience, and, and I say that to, to say that our audience is an unusually um, well-read audience, really is. Um, but even the vast majority of our audience probably has next to no knowledge of Manichaeanism at all. Um, right, Rich? I mean, you've, 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 uh, you've lectured on Manichaeanism, right? Manichaeism? Ma Manichaeanism? Ma Manichaeism. Uh, <clears throat> I've seen those in the grocery, in, in, in the uh, department stores. Manichaeans. Man is that... <clears throat> That's pretty much where most of us are. Um, I looked at the uh, I looked at the notes from my seminary, and remember, my church history class was awesome. Classes were, were awesome. My church history professor was awesome, but church history in a general seminary course is an elective. Sometimes it's required. Um, hopefully, should has always been in the past, but isn't so much anymore can sometimes be done in a Jan term class. And Manichaeanism was not discussed to any deep length. I, I mean, I knew who Manny was. I My notes did say that uh, he was, you know, born in the early third century, you know, so flourished in that time period. Uh, Gnostic influences, Eastern influences, that was about it. That was about it. Um, so... By the way, um, if you're really interested in a quick up to speed on it, I was really impressed. This isn't always the place to go, but somebody did their homework or some group of people did their homework. The article on Manichaeanism on Wikipedia is big and lots of references and not half bad at all. I mean, for Wikipedia, I was impressed. Really was. I mean, nice graphics and um when you study it, because you notice he mentioned here, he said, but of course they omit the Stoics, Gnostics, and Manichaeans who previously interpreted these texts as teaching unilateral determinism. So, first of all, anyone who knows anything about Stoics, Gnostics, and Manichaeanism, um, knows that there are differences between each one of these. Manichaeanism is a form of Gnosticism, but with an incredibly wide variety of influences that Manny brought into his self-made religion in the middle of the third century. So in other words, around 250-ish. And he brought in stuff from Zoroastrianism and Buddhism and Gnosticism and Christianity. And it is a massive mishmash. There's all sorts of different Jesuses and, and, and it's just a mishmash of messy, messy stuff. And it does not even begin to share any foundational worldview similarity to anything that could be identified as Christianity. You don't have a single creator God. You do not have anything like that. And so any kind of, for example, the Gnostics, let's, let's take a step back. The Gnostics precede Manny, even though there's continuing development in various forms of Gnosticism during Manny's life as well. But Gnosticism really begins flourishing about 100 years before Manichaeism does. And exists in its primitive forms, even during the New Testament period, though the final forms that it, well, there weren't any final forms of Gnosticism, let's put it that way. Um, there, there were final forms as far as this, as far as it developed in a certain area, something like that. But the Gnostic worldview is a dualistic worldview, but it, to, to say that it has a singular personal creator, um, 
Yahweh was an evil God in Gnosticism. Well, in once Gnosticism encounters Judaism and Christianity and makes room for it, Yahweh becomes identified as an evil God because he created the earth. And since it's dualistic, if it's physical, it's evil. Therefore, Yahweh is a demiurge, an evil deity, powerful, but evil. And so there is a divine spark in each person coming from the one divine source, and that ends up in Manichaeism as well, as well as his Gnosticism. But how you access that, exactly what that means, depends on how it's fleshed out in the various Gnostic groups, and, and Manny even changes his own view over time on that. The point is this. None of them are based upon a monotheistic worldview. None of them are based upon the prophets and apostles. None of them are based upon grammatical historical interpretation of New Testament texts. Um, none of that matters to Ken Wilson. As long as you can draw a parallel, as long as you can, as long as the Gnostics, because see, see, the mystery religions, one aspect of certain of the mystery religions, notice how I try to always leave open the reality that there were many manifestations of these religions and many differing ways, and there is no one Gnosticism, there is no one Manichaeism, because even Manny changed his own beliefs over his own lifetime. Some people ran with one thing, some people ran with another thing. Um, that's how you have to talk about these things, because you know that there are differing interpretations of even the documents that are available to us today from the Nag Hammadi library or, or whatever else it might be, um, as to the different kinds of Gnosticism and the, and the different aspects of Manichaeism and all the rest of that kind of stuff. So you'll notice that as I say this, I'm, I'm not saying Gnostics believe this. It was a form of Gnosticism that believed something like this. And in the mystery religions, many of them believed that by going through their various uh, religious ceremonies, you would receive gnosis, knowledge, that would allow you to free yourself from the trappings of this physical body. The real you is that divine spark that longs to be reunited to the great divine spark, but that can't happen as long as you're attached to the flesh. Now, was that a regular theme in mo most dualistic and Gnostic? Yes. Were there exceptions? Of course. You have to, you have to recognize those things. So those who partook in the mysteries might be called the chosen ones because they have received this special knowledge. And so what you do, what Ken Wilson does, is you just draw a nice straight line, get out a ruler, go, boom, elect in Calvin, boom, elect amongst the Manichaeans and the Gnostics. So, uh, and we, I, I do want to get into this, especially this one later on. Um, there's a discussion of Basilides and gift of faith. Completely different context, but he brings it up a number of times because it, it's one of his killer verses. I want to get into those. I want to read the read the read the, all the contexts. I have them in the early church fathers, uh Saras Lingo Greki, things like that. Um, and just show you why how this is is being done and how. Those who work in the field go, huh? but if you don't have access to this kind of stuff, um, and I, I don't remember when it was, 1995 or, I forget when we got the TLGC to ROM, but we could barely afford it back then. Uh, yeah, had to turn all those things back in, but um, had it for years, had it for a long, long time. Uh, we were one of the first people that had it. Yeah, for, for doing my, uh, when I did my THD. We got that for me, and it was extremely, extremely useful. But if you're, if you can look up these sources, then you go, whoa, wait a minute. But see, a lot of people just can't look up these sources, and so you go, oh, well, you know, must be what it is. So um, the point is, 
going back to what I started reading, you can tell I'm not going to get very far with it. Um, August, look, background is the whole point here. Having the background in church history is the whole point here. Augustinian Calvinists claim the only person to correctly interpret the Apostle Paul's deterministic scriptures for the first four centuries is Augustine. No, we don't. No, we don't. Calvin didn't say it, Augustine didn't say it. Um, you're assuming that, that some of the some of the assumptions here, and, and it's all through the book. Maybe in his dissertation he dealt with this, but he forgot it in here. We don't have a tremendous amount of the early church church's writings. For many of the earliest fathers, what we have is because somebody quotes them partially at a later point in time. If we didn't have Eusebius's church history, we wouldn't even know some of these people existed. But the reality is we have only a small portion of the extant literature. And so one of the first things that caught me when I first started looking through this was how many times it was the universal view. The only fair way of actually saying that is in the extant literature that we have that specifically addresses this issue, it seems that the predominant view prior to would be this, and then Augustine changed it. That's fair. This has no, no desire to be fair. It doesn't even try to be fair. It is completely imbalanced, horrifically so. Just way out there. That's what just, again, I was just like, what? What's going on here? So um, I would argue um, that uh, the epistle to Diognetius, we call it Mathetes, and Mathetes just means a disciple. It's this guy who wrote to Diognetius. Um, there's good evidence, fragmentary. Seems to me that he has the same view of the elect. Clement of Rome talks about the elect all the time. Are you telling me Clement of Rome was a proto-Gnostic? No, I don't think so. Um, his doctrine seems to go along those same lines. But these are not the primary topics that the early church writers were addressing either. They had other topics that they were addressing, other things that they were focused upon, primarily theological and Christological issues. As I've pointed out, I don't know how many times in this program, it takes to the fourth century before we have a full length treatise on the atonement. And there aren't too many people alive today that would actually agree with everything even that said in light of all the different theories of the atonement that you can parse out of Tertullian and Irenaeus and the recapitulation theory and all the, you know, all this type of stuff. So making the first centuries, the theological standard, I, that's the other thing is like, yeah, I'm used to the fact that the Roman Catholics do that. Um, you're not a Roman Catholic, so I'm not sure where in the world you're going on this. But that type of thing happens. Um, so Augustinian Calvinists claim that Augustine, in his dispute with Pelagius, provided important and insightful interpretations of key soteriological texts that have been demonstrated to be consistently true based upon the hermeneutics of the grammatical historical interpretation of the original languages of Scripture, even though Augustine had limited access to the original languages of Scripture. And when he was in error, it was primarily due to his reliance upon the Latin Vulgate. Well, not the Vulgate, but the Latin. Um, the Vulgate was translated during his lifetime by Jerome, so, but the Latin tradition. See, that's a completely different statement. And that kind of careful, accurate statement that takes in consideration a wide amount, amount of information is never found in here. There just aren't any of them there. Everything in here is just pedal to the metal, full, I have a thesis, and I'm going to cram it into history, and I'm going to put it out there, and that's just all there is to it. So... Uh, well, as far as its abuse of history, yes. Yeah, very much so. Um, so that so 
when he argues that the Stoics, Gnostics, and Manichaeans had previously interpreted this text as teaching unilateral determinism, what they meant, what Augustine meant, are two different things. And to, to confuse them just means you are a very, 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 very theologically confused person. Two different things. Two different contexts, two different meanings. And then to assume that there is a straight line that just simply goes, Augustine, Calvin, and Calvin's just sitting there going, whatever you say. That's not what he did. You can pretend that. I know the quote. Go ahead. You guys repeat the I read it. You go ahead and repeat the quote. I'll take it apart when I get to it. Just be ready. I already, already looked it up. Yeah, I know when, uh, that, that, uh, that Calvin said he could write his confession of faith out of what Augustine said. Look at the first few pages before that little context thing. How many of you, I wonder, in that group, they're just going, oh, I know. How many of you read the pages before that? How many of you looked it up? How many of you found it online? How many of you did your homework? That's the question. I continue. Somehow, Calvinists purport only Augustine, baptized in highly deterministic Stoicism, Neoplatonism, and Gnostic Manichaeism, got it right. In their view, every one of over 50 early church fathers got it wrong on human freedom choice. Again, I stop again. So he, what's he assuming? That he knows, every, he, even though there are not 50 early church fathers that wrote a book on the subject, he is assuming based upon what fragmentary material we have left that he can come up with a universal perspective. So from fragmentary stuff, and many of these early church fathers did not address this in the fragments we have. How do you know what they believed? You don't know that. You don't know that. Please, please. This is not how you do, this is not how you respect church history. This is not how you do church history. Astonishing. Anyway, in their view, uh, da, 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 da. even Augustine himself admitted that he had tried but failed to continue in the essential and unanimous Christian doctrine of free will throughout the first four centuries. What Wilson will do is he will use this kind of language. He will, he will make an argument through use of language without ever substantiating it. Just the language itself becomes the argument. So did, then he at least provides the quote. What is, what, is that what Augustine said? Did Augustine identify unanimous Christian doctrine of free will throughout the first four centuries? Here's the quote. In the solution of this question, I struggled in behalf of free choice of the will, but the grace of God won out. That's the quote. That's the quote. And now, how is this relevant to today? I have said over and over again, that provisionists are an, not only anti-reformed theology, they're anti-reformation. They are on Rome's side. In the nature of the will, they, they, are, they are not just in the Tiber River, they have put their, their rope around the dock uh, over on the other side of the Tiber River. Listen to this. The famous reformed theologian Benjamin Warfield commented, and I'm appreciative of the fact that it's a direct quote. Um, a, lot of, a lot of folks know this quote. I memorized it decades ago. Uh, they know the quote, but they don't always quote it accurately. The Reformation, inwardly considered, was just the ultimate triumph of, a doc of Augustine's doctrine of grace. It actually continues over Augustine's doctrine of the church. I, I don't know why that part wasn't quoted. And then notice the statement. Warfield's statement is pinpoint accurate. Remember a few weeks ago when I explained why this was? When I first started looking at this book, I spent the time to talk about why did Augustine contradict himself? Why could Augustine be used by both Roman Catholics and uh, Protestants during the course of the battles of the Reformation, especially in the 16th century? And I pointed out that Augustine is a tremendous example to us of how the battles of your life determine what you see and what you don't see. And the two great battles that Augustine fought, first part of his ministry, the Donatist controversy, a schism and a division in the church, a schism over the concept of the sacraments, 
ex opera operato, ex opera operanti. The Donatist ex opera operanti that the state of grace, the, the spiritual purity of the person performing the sacrament determined the sacrament's efficacy. Therefore, they didn't follow the Catholic chain of succession in the bishopric because they alleged that one of the people involved in the setting apart of a particular bishop um, was an apostate, a traitor, a traditor, had given up the scriptures under the Roman persecution. Um, so Augustine develops ex opera operato. It is by the functioning of the sacrament, not the person performing it, which remains Roman Catholic theology to this day. That remains Roman Catholic theology to this day. And that was part and parcel of that. That's what defined August, the beginning of Augustine's ministry. And so that's what he's focused upon. The end of his ministry is focused upon his struggles with Pelagius and all the related political struggles. Remember uh, the battle with Zosimus and um, the, the North African bishops standing firm against Pelagius, even when the Pope in Rome is sort of going, well, I'm not sure Pelagius is all that bad. And then the North African bishops are saying, yes, he is. And that's where the Rome has spoken, the case is closed error came from. Remember that? Came up in the in the debate with Pierce Stravinskis. Oh my goodness. You know what? 20 year anniversary for the Stravinskis debate next year. We gotta do something about that. We gotta, uh, we gotta do something, we're old. <laughs> Are you are you just telling me we're not going to remember it next year? It's going to get right on by. Yeah, we we need to look up the date of when that was because um, because I can guarantee you to to this very day, Peter Stravinskis really, really, really dislikes me. Yeah, look it up in your gizmo. That's right. <laughs> yeah. May twenty fourth, two thousand one. May twenty fourth, two thousand one. We need to put that on the calendar. Um, that uh, sometime the week before that, we need to uh, have a have a uh, Peter Stravinskis Memorial Day <laughs> for, for that particular one. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, the Warfield statement is exactly correct. This is why there was a contradiction in Augustine. That's what Warfield is saying: is Warfield's doctrine of the Church and Warfield's doctrine of grace are contradictory to one another because of the two great battles that he fought. Augustine, what did I say? Oh, I said Warfield is right that Augustine's doctrine of the church is different than his doctrine of grace. And so um, notice what Wilson then says. Warfield's statement is pinpoint accurate, but unfortunately, due to Luther's and Calvin's reliance upon Augustine, the unmerited grace of the Christian God did not triumph. In Augustinian Calvinism, parenthesis, reformed, parenthesis closed, theology, it was the radicalized grace of the Manichaean God that triumphed. So the Reformation had a different God. That's Ken Wilson's, that's not Ken Wilson's conclusion based upon his studies, that's where he started. And that is plainly seen here. Plainly seen here. I don't know how any dissertation advisor, any Dr. Vader, did not see that because it's so obvious. It's so plain. And it has to be challenged right from the start. So here what's being said, the Reformation proclaimed a Gnostic God. That's, that's Ken Wilson's conclusion. Now, we will discover he failed horrifically to substantiate that. And the forms of argumentation are stunning, stunningly bad, but that's what's being said. Augustine was the father of Tulip. Now, I've had so many non-reformed people argue that not even... Calvin believed Tulip in the fullest sense that that's a, I mean, Tulip is obviously a us looking back and formulating Calvin's theology, or at least the theology of the next generation. But Augustine was the father of Tulip. 
Total depravity, total inability to respond to God. That's not what Augustine said, and that's not what Calvinism says. And if you don't know that, then you're not even listening. You're not even doing the first, the first bit of attempting to honestly deal with this issue. That's not what we believe. Total inability to respond positively in repentance and faith to God? Yes. But all mankind responds to God in many different ways. It, one, one of the most famous statements that Calvin ever made was, is, is a meme that is all over Facebook and Twitter. What do you say? What do you say about the human heart? The human heart is a constant factory of idols. It's a constant factory of idols. And he was right. But what does that mean? That means the heart responds to God in rebellion, in the creation of idols. Total depravity does not mean an inability to respond to God. It means man responds to God within the capacity that his fallen nature limits him to. So there, there was never the slightest attempt. And look, I've been doing this a few years, folks. I have encountered over my years many people in this spectrum of, of you that simply will not accurately represent Reformed theology because they detest it with a visceral detestation. And I think in their mind, to even think about accurately representing it is an act of compromise. And I think that's what we've got here. Unconditional election, Gnostic, a Stoic, Gnostic, Manichaean, and then he came up with this DUPIED, D-U-P-I-E-D, as an acronym for unconditional predestination of individuals to eternal damnation. Um, limited atonement, Christ died only for the elect. Irresistible grace, ready for what that means? Violent Manichaean grace. Yeah, that's what regeneration means. Violent Manichaean grace. And the gift of perseverance Invented by Augustine to explain the extreme differences in how persons live their lives following salvific infant baptism. Now, the, the Dr. Wilson's understanding of the incredibly complex field of baptism in the early church is astonishingly shallow. Astonishingly shallow. I mean, when I was listening to him talking about Augustine trying to come up with an understanding of how to believe in the elect, but still have, still go with the preceding traditions that were his, and I was like, really? Wow. This is, yow! Just really, really bad. Um, interesting discussion, um, but... Think about it. What you're actually being told. Think of all the sermons you've heard out of John chapter 6, John chapter 10, John chapter 17, Philippians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 2, on the subject of the perseverance of the saints. Had nothing to do with what any of those texts said. It was all because of Manny, the guy who made a mishmash of Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, Gnosticism, Judaism, and Christianity. Yeah, that's where it actually came from. No one has ever exegeted these texts, honestly. We, we just, no one exegeted. All those, all the, the decades that I've spent going through this explanation, that explanation of John 6, in my debate with Leighton, I never, I wasn't standing there reading Romans 9, translating it and exegeting it. No, I wasn't doing that. I had Manny's notes in front of me. That's, that's, that's what it was. I just, I, y'all need to know that, uh, that's all the, 
So, um, yeah, we just we just we just mindlessly follow what uh, what somebody else said, what Manny said, even though most of us have never read a single word that Manny ever said. But we still now I'm not saying don't don't hear me wrong. All of us, our traditions have been impacted by those who've come before us. But this kind of simplistic straight line stuff is simply absurd. I mean, any serious historian, any serious historian knows that after Augustine, even as soon as Gottschalk, you already have development. You, there, there's already a change in context. So, so no matter what, by the time you get post Renaissance and you, you put Augustine's interpretations into the context of post Erasmian New Testament's available, Old Testament's available, Latin is being rejected as the primary source you're now dealing with. That introduced that that makes a straight line laughing, laughably silly and simplistic and erroneous. That's why nobody believes it. That's uh, well, no one should believe it. Uh, yet, um, therefore, modern Calvinism in these deterministic distinctives, has more in common with ancient philosophies and religious heresies than with early Christianity. An objective evaluation of the facts cannot avoid this startling conclusion. Here's my assertion. That's the conclusion that Dr. Wilson started with, and not shockingly, therefore, ended with. As we will see... As we have time, in the midst of lots of important other stuff, um, to document this kind of stuff, to dig into the citations. Um, this is what happens when you have a monomaniacal focus. I have a thesis, and that thesis is man's free will must be defended, and therefore, I'm going to find a way to do it. And we have encountered so many different ways in which that has been done down through the years. So many different ways. This is a more recent way. Through, unfortunately, the utilization of historical documents and resources that most people simply don't have sitting in their library. Or don't know necessarily how to find in some of the resources where you can find them. I mean, CCEL has some of these things. Um, some of the uh, books and, and articles are available, uh, but many of them are not uh, available unless you have access to a research library. Um, and so checking all the sources can be somewhat difficult. But we, we will definitely be looking at some of these and, and going, you see, the source actually didn't say that. Now, I know what someone's going to say. You just need to read the dissertation. Look, I've looked at, what was it, $95 or something like that? Here, here's my, here's my thesis. If you can't take your dissertation and summarize it accurately in a book of that length, you shouldn't have written it in the first place. Shouldn't have written it in the first place. So if this ain't accurate, if this ain't good enough, I'm not faulting it. I'm not faulting it for what it doesn't contain. I'm faulting it for what it does. For the citations it actually does provide. That's, uh, that's the issue there. Um, real quickly here. Yeah, let me just read you one more. This is from the conclusion. This is the next paragraph. Because current Calvinist deterministic interpretations of Scripture passages are interpretations brought into Christianity through Augustine's Manichaean past. Excuse me. I read Romans 8 and 9 in Greek long before I ever had any idea of any connection between Manny and Augustine at all. So, did you even try to demonstrate? I don't get the feeling that Dr. Wilson can engage these texts. I really don't. I, I, I could be wrong. I just did not get that feeling. So, to say that 
that you you can bring entire interpretations. Are, are you seriously saying that, well, Dr. Allen was quoting from what primary commentary is on Romans when we, when we responded to him? Douglas Moo, a little bit from Murray, and Tom, and, and Tom Schreiner. Are you saying that Moo and Schreiner are devotees of Manny? Are you, can you prove that their exegetical methodology is based upon the worldview of Manichaeism? If you can't, then you've failed in your thesis. And that is a fundamental refutation of your, of your position. If any meaningful interpretation of these texts yields the conclusions that we have presented, and that your side has been noticeably conspicuous for badly not being able to defend against, then that statement is absurd. Calvinism leans upon Manichaean interpretations of key scriptures. That is an absurdity. I'll quote it again. Calvinism leans upon Manichaean interpretations of key scriptures. I'll say it again. Absurdity. Calvinism lacks a solid historical and biblical foundation within early Christianity. It rests upon unstable it rests upon unstable sand of ancient heretical and pagan doctrines. For these reasons, the tiny foundation upholding the impressively logical structure of August, Augustinian Calvinism should be pronounced unstable and condemned as unsafe. Can you see why I was I was expecting, oh, we've got a we've got a Oxford dissertation. This this, this that means it will have these commitments to scholarship, language, care, balance, none of that. Now, maybe that was all it was in the dissertation. Got all sucked out before it got in here because it's not in there. 